a break from the normal episode as I provide a little comic relief today and share our perfectly planned anniversary trip. As I'm sure you know, all the planning in the world does not guarantee that things turn out perfect or even like you want. I don't say this as a downer, but in this world, perfect is unattainable. Because God has called me to do this grief work, I tend to relate most things to going through grief and to the hope that God gives even in the worst moments of life. As I share our trip, I'm also going to share two important points to help you as you are walking through grief. Hey friend, welcome to the Grief to Great Day podcast. Do you feel like you're going crazy? Is the shower the only place for you to really cry? Are you surrounded by people, but you still feel all alone? Do you want to be the you you were before your loved one died, but you have no idea how to get there? I'm Steph Cabanis, Southern by choice, wife, turtle triathlete, Jesus follower, and fellow traveler in the journey of grief. I too struggled to breathe, questioned God and my faith, and thought I would never be happy again. But God took my brokenness and he turned it into a breakthrough. So if you're ready to understand how to navigate grief, lean into your faith and take just one step towards healing, then bring your ugly cry, get into a comfortable place, even if that's your bed right now, and let the healing begin. Girl, there's hope for your future. So I'm going to start today's episode with a little story (laughs) about two weeks ago. Um, Jeff and I have been married for five years now, and I'm very thankful that I have found a good and a godly man. We were both married previously. I was married very young, and I was divorced for over 25 years. I never thought that I would marry again, and I figured if I did, it probably (laughs) wouldn't be a great marriage. Okay, I didn't always think that, but based on the first one, I don't know. It just kind of always makes you wonder. I did tell God that if it was going to be good and if it was going to happen, it was going to be up to him. And that is what happened. And my kind and sweet husband planned a really special trip for us to go on a riverboat cruise in Europe to go down the Danube over a week's time. So he has planned this since August of last year. We've talked about it multiple times, and it was supposed to happen. Well, it did happen. It happened um, April 15th to the 23rd. We were both so excited about it, and all the anticipation, and, you know, you know how that works. So we even, you know, we read about it, the best way to pack, to make sure that you kind of pack in thirds, and you take a little extra on your carry-on just in case, And you know that you can plan, you can make the plan perfect, and what happens is usually not according to plan. So we left out of Raleigh, and I'm just going to give you some details on this because it's actually almost comical as a whole picture. We left out of Raleigh um, midday on the 15th, and we were headed to Newark where we were going to get an international flight to take us to Munich. We circled Newark, New Jersey for quite a while (laughs) with a lot of turbulence. And the captain comes on and says, as you can tell, we've been circling Newark because we're not allowed to land. Apparently they had some weather issues and there was, you know, a backlog of planes trying to fly into there. And then he says that, you know, we don't have enough fuel to continue our circling so we have been diverted to Dulles the diversion was just to gas up and go so we landed they gassed us up and we never left again the next 10 hours of our day (laughs) included deboarding reboarding four different times and then ultimately having the flight canceled we were in line at the um, airlines, I won't say which airline because I'm a little salty, but <laughs> we were we were in line, I kid you not, with hundreds of people for over four hours just to get 
another flight. So we have missed several flights by then. We're already going to be late for this riverboat cruise. And we spend the night in Washington, D.C. or the suburbs of Virginia near Dulles Airport. Um, you know, in eastern North Carolina, there's no need to take an Uber. So Jeff and I thought we were pretty awesome to be taking an Uber. We also were told to get our luggage because, you know, we were no longer going to go to Newark, New Jersey. We went down to the baggage claim, and this was after midnight at this point, and they tell us, you cannot have your luggage tonight because there's no one here to get it for you. Come back in the morning, and you can have your luggage. In the interim, we um, call our you know, riverboat cruise people, who were absolutely awesome, and they have rebooked us a flight through Iceland. <laughs> through Iceland and I was just like oh my god who goes to Iceland but okay so we had a, a flight book through Iceland we returned to Dulles to get, to get our luggage and to continue on this trek well we were told which we already knew because y'all you got to get these air tags we had air tags in our luggage and at least it told us where our luggage was which was not at Dulles anymore it was flown to Newark, New Jersey, which we were never going to go back to. So our luggage is gone, and we're flying to Iceland. So we flew to Iceland, and from Iceland we flew to Munich, and they picked us up in Munich. The kind riverboat guy says, don't worry about your luggage right now. We're going to take care of it. We're just going to get you to the boat. So we get to the boat just a couple of hours before it leaves for its next destination, we're a day and a half late. That first night, we had dinner, and two couples came and sat with us, and they were from <laughs> Jersey, who lived really close to this Newark airport. And they were very, very kind, because they listened to our woes. See, when we got on the ship, we were told by the, the girl, you know, who's kind of like the service representative, that we could probably just kiss our luggage goodbye for the duration of our trip because they didn't do a good job of you know finding the boat from port to port and that she suggested we just go shopping because insurance would cover all that and get anything that we needed well we needed a lot of stuff so anyway we have dinner with these really nice people these two couples and just like wow this is what happened and I'm going to relate everything to grief because, you know, it's what I do. But in that moment, just somebody saying, oh, my gosh, I can't believe that happened. And, you know, tell me more. And and one of the guys like, wait, wait, you got to wait for Larry. Larry's not here. Larry's going to want to hear these details. Just the listening was really, really helpful. So we have this nice dinner on the boat and we go to bed and we're like, we're going to go shop tomorrow and make up and we're not going to let this get us down. And that night, like out of nowhere, I'm sick as a dog. I have a high fever. I am like so hot and chattering because I'm so cold and I'm sick, like coughing and other stuff. I mean, I just, all of it. All of it could not sleep. It was absolutely miserable. We wake up the next morning, or I was awake, but you know, Jeff's confused. He's like, I don't know if I should go, if I should stay here with you. I'm like, you need to go. So he went. We didn't have our little shopping trip. He did pick up a few things, got me a t shirt. And for the next two days, I was sick in the bed. So now we're three and a half days into this trip. My husband's taking our anniversary trip by himself, and I can't hardly get vertical. So we have three days left, and I'm starting to feel a little bit better. Again, everyone on the boat is very kind. And, you know, it kind of becomes a joke. Oh, new T-shirt of the day. And I will say that the, the ship was also kind enough to do our laundry daily and not charge us a dime for it. So on when we have three days left, we um, we get into Vienna, and Jeff and I did a, a couple tours in Vienna. I was I was not great, but I was I really didn't want to miss Vienna. So we made Vienna. We had seen this cafe on TV, you know, since last year, 
It's called Cafe Jamel. And it's pretty famous in Vienna, so we we did make our way there. I really couldn't eat a whole lot, though, but I did taste it, and some of that stuff was so good. And the second day, we were also in Vienna, and we just, like, did our own thing for the whole day. We found our way on the subway, which I was pretty impressed with. Um, I am half German, but I really speak no German, just I don't know, some cuss words is all I really (laughs) learned growing up and some really basic things. And then the last day of our trip, we were in Budapest. They call it Budapest. And the city is really interesting because it has a Buddha side and a Pesh side. So that's why it's Budapest, because Buddha is like the high mountain side and then Pesh is very flat, but it's, it's all the same city. And saw some you know, incredible things. Historically, it is very cool to go back in time and to stand where things have happened that have changed not only, you know, individual lives, but the course of history. So, you know, that part was was lovely. And then we have to be up the next morning at like 2.30 in the morning because we have to leave the ship at 3.15 a.m. to catch a 6 o'clock flight in Budapest. And we get to Budapest, and of course, the flight, the second flight has been canceled. And we're like, Lord, not again. But this was a different airline carrier, so they did make arrangements for us to get on another flight to a different destination, which, I don't know, kind of held us up four or five additional hours. And by that point, I was getting really sick again. So we got home pretty late um, on the 23rd. And on the 24th, I was just on the couch sick, sick, sick again. Um, I ended up going to the doctor. And though we had taken a home kit test for COVID, um, which tested negative, I did test positive for COVID had COVID before and it was nothing. And this time it was very much something. It was like all the symptoms all at once. But we are home and we are safe and we are thankful. And I, except for my voice, I am feeling pretty good. There was um, a dinner that we had on the ship and it was, it was two different couples from the ones I mentioned previously. And the lady was a nurse and the man was a paratrooper from, you know, way back. And we were just having, you know, normal conversation, just sharing things. And she, the nurse, had shared that she and her daughter had been on a Mediterranean trip before and how much she enjoyed it and how, you know, her daughter has a lot of autoimmune issues. And she said, of course, I have a lot of health issues too. And, you know, I have cancer and then I have to worry about different things. And so, Like, when she was finished talking, I said, did you say you had cancer or you have cancer? And she's like, no, I have it. I've been, you know, diagnosed for over four years now. She said, and it's inoperable. So I've just been doing chemo every other week, she said, and it seems to be holding things at bay. She said, so I have determined that I am enjoying this trip and I'm enjoying my life as best I can for as long as I have. Now, that was a really poignant moment for me because Jeff and I were kind of, (laughs) we were feeling so beat up. I mean, it was like daggers on the left and daggers on the right. But I mean, in that moment when someone says that and she makes this determination that she's going to live her life as best she can, I, I don't know. It just lets you know, great reminder yet again, I wish I didn't need these constant reminders, but a great reminder to be grateful for, you know, things were jacked up. Our flight was jacked up. We didn't have luggage. I was sick. But bigger than that, you know, people are struggling for their lives, literally, and struggling with death. And those things are way harder than anything that we went through. So, It was a great reminder for me. And I think it, I don't know, it's not like Jeff and I are big complainers anyway, but for me, it was a good way not to complain at all, honestly. 
And if you've followed along and you've listened to everything that I've told you about this awesome trip, um, you may be wondering about our luggage. And we never did see our luggage. We had to tell them where it was multiple times. And it just sat in Newark, New Jersey. So if y'all live in Newark, New Jersey, you know, I love you. But we really don't like Newark, New Jersey anymore. Just saying. Our luggage did arrive at our house like four or five days after we got home. <laughs> so hopefully this trip of ours has provided a little comic relief for you. And there are two takeaways I want to share. Number one, you can make all the best plans in the world and you can work hard to make those plans happen. But ultimately, we don't have control over a lot of what happens in our lives. It's that age-old question of why do bad things happen to good people? And it's because we live in a fallen world. And on this side of heaven, there will always be struggles. Now, for Jeff and I, this was a vacation that went badly. It's a disappointment and a major inconvenience. But in the end, it is something that we will get over fairly quickly. Before Monica died, I was more of a chicken little-ish kind of person where the sky was always falling regardless of the circumstances. Now, grief truly has given me a perspective that is higher than current circumstances and a gratitude for what I do have. The second takeaway for you is to take the pressure off of yourself. To recognize that grief is heavy, it is consuming, and it will take you over for a while. The harder you fight against that, the harder you're going to make it for yourself. And you also have to allow room for God to do his work in your life. I know you're thinking, how, how did I come up with this from a trip? Well, when I was sick on the ship, I had a fever, which made me a little confused. <laughs> I might have hallucinated a little, but I was taken over by the symptoms, and my goal was just to make it through the day. Doesn't that sound familiar? So you're unable to function normally when you're first walking through a life-changing grief. It's just not physically possible. In those moments, you want to feel better and have normalcy so bad that you begin to fight against yourself. So you have to allow yourself to have those make it through the day kind of days without expectations. Don't allow anyone to should on you, but equally important, don't should on yourself. You know, feeling like you should be stronger, that you should be okay in front of others, that you shouldn't be so sad all the time. That, my friend, won't help you. Allow your body to process the shock, the pain, and the symptoms of grief. Allow yourself to have time to heal and don't put time frames on that healing. You will not always hurt like this, but the process is not quick. Life will be good again. Believe it or not, life will be good again. And no matter how far in the pit you are this very day, there will still be a tomorrow where you're going to walk with joy and with purpose. And this is not me just trying to pump you up or make you feel better. This is truth from the word of God. You will breathe, laugh, and live again. If you're ready to take a brave step towards your healing, there's help available. Grief to Great Day offers free and paid faith-based resources. So you can join the private Facebook group. You don't have to suffer in silence anymore. Be a part of a group of faith-filled women who get it in a way the world can't. The daily pain and struggle of grief is not denied here, but faith paves the way for hope in this group. You can download the free Loss, Grief, and Healing Seminar. This is the best faith-based introduction of what to expect in your grief journey. Download the seminar if you want a reason to hope and learn how to heal. Today is not your forever, and you are not alone. You can also purchase grief coaching. If you're looking for one-to-one -one support to figure out your next best step, 
or if you want to understand where you are in the grief process, or you just need accountability in taking those healing steps, these one-hour grief coaching sessions are the answer for you. You can also purchase the workshop called The First Year of Grief, How to Survive with Hope and Heal. This workshop is the action-oriented step-taking program you need to give you foundational tools to navigate your grief in the first year especially. Remember, time itself does not heal all wounds. You have to take steps. In this workshop, you'll discover how to pursue God even when you don't want to pray. You'll understand the roller coaster of grief so you know what's normal and what to expect. You will learn to process daily life with practical help to get you through those I can't get out of the bed days. And you'll find where to seek support because I'll share grief resources that are best for you. Look, I've walked this journey and never thought I could be happy again. But God, he restored my joy and gave me a calling. So no matter how dark and hopeless your day is today, this can be your story too. It is my great joy to help you get there. Your safe place for all things grief can be found on the website, grief the number two great day.com. This includes all the resources I just shared and in addition, the grief to great day podcast and the book dying to be healed. Regardless of where you are right now, you can breathe, laugh and live again. Thank you for being here today for showing up. If this podcast has given you hope, encouragement or helped you in any way, share it with a friend either in a text or on your social platforms. Also, please subscribe, rate, and leave a written review on iTunes. It's a huge blessing for me to know that you're out there. Lastly, and this is important, you are not alone. Connect with me on the Grief to Great Day website, the link is below, and sign up for our free newsletters. I want to be able to pray for you by name. Remember, grief isn't something you're going to get over, but a great day is something you can get to.